1930s fashion, a time of hyper-femininity, timeless elegance, and glamour. I'm Estella Mendes. Welcome to Fashion History Sessions. The 1930s start in a deep economic depression. The crash of 1929 destroyed fortunes, threw people into unemployment, and spread a wave of poverty in the Western world. This decade is a reaction to this economic catastrophe. During the Great Depression, the American average income pay was of $17 per week, but some made as little as $7 a week. And a lot of those who kept their jobs saw their pay being cut up to 60%. Nevertheless, the rich got richer, while the poor got poorer. The growth of poverty led to the emergence of authoritarian governments that would incentivize the vision and claim the solution to the economic situation, which by the end of the decade it would culminate in war. The 1930s are also the decade of the swing era and the golden age of Hollywood. Since the 1920s, motion pictures had become not only popular but influential. By the 1930s, movies had sound and color. In a world full of hardship, movies presented escapism, beauty and glamour. The studio system creates the Hollywood stars like Jean Harlow, Mae West and Greta Garbo, which image was carefully constructed with clothes, hair, makeup and good lighting. In a world full of pain, the movie would introduce dream and beauty into women's lives. Women's jobs were not affected in the same proportion as men's who worked in coal mining or manufacturing. Women's jobs were related to more stable industries. The U.S. employment for women actually grew by 24% in this decade. Women's jobs range from less qualified positions like domestic service to more qualified jobs in nursing teaching, civil service or secretarial, a smaller percentage of women would pursue academic careers. Though marriage was the norm, the 1930s sees a decline in marriage rates. This means that there were more single women, and these women had economic independence. And the fashion and beauty industries will bear this idea in mind. In the previous decade we see an increase in ready-to-wear, Clothes were simple and practical. The American fashion industry was more modern than most European ones, gaining traction in the global fashion manufacturing landscape. The women who could afford haute couture in the 1930s were also looking for less expensive clothes. This demanded an increase of quality and ready-to-wear. To meet this demand, Britain created the wholesale couture a kind of fashion that blended haute couture with ready-to-wear. Paris remained the fashion inspiration. Couturiers would often create seasonal lines which were capsule collections to be adapted to the needs of the mass market. These clothes were produced at more affordable prices. The 1929 stock market crash was a massive blow to Paris fashion. Many orders were immediately cancelled. In 1923, Parisian haute couture was the second highest export of France. Ten years later, it would fall to the 27th position. Though haute couture would later recover, it would never reach the magnificent years of the first two decades of the 20th century. But Paris was still the fashion capital of the world, attracting clients and foreign creatives like Main Botcher, Elsa Schiaparelli and Cristobal Balenciaga. The world was facing hardship and women's fashion becomes very proper and full of rules. Society was frightened and fashion retracts from great experimentation and rule-breaking. Unlike the boyish look of the previous decade, the 1930s bring ultra-femininity. The waist was now defined and hemlines dropped. The silhouette was of a tall and lean woman, which will ignite a diet culture. Colors are soft there is an abundance of prints and a craze for polka dots. Haute couture from Paris continues to dictate fashion, with Coco Chanel remaining in the pole position, but now with a rival, Elsa Schiaparelli, 
who brings an element of fun into fashion. We see the rise of American couturiers like Maine Botcher and Charles James, who by the end of the decade established themselves in New York. But Hollywood costumes will also make women dream with luxury and glamour. It all started with a long white dress with pom-pom sleeves. Joan Crawford wore this dress by costume designer Adrian in a movie called Letty Linton in 1932. This became the true it dress. Women flocked to department stores to buy this dress made with inexpensive materials and sold at affordable prices. Hollywood studios started to see that they could capitalize on their costumes and started to license them to department stores. And eventually opened stores dedicated only to Hollywood-inspired fashion. Fashion was now dictated by Hollywood, at least in America. This is unprecedented, as Paris has always been at the helm of the fashion trends. But this moment also marks the beginning of what would become the true American fashion, made by Americans in America. The dream that Hollywood movies was presenting could now, at the smaller scale, be attained, and women would be able to ignite their glamorous sight. Hollywood will start to lose its influence in the late 1940s as Christian Dior takes the world of fashion by storm. And in the future, it will employ Parisian couturiers who will continue to create cinematic, iconic dresses. During this decade, there is a big difference between day wear and evening wear. Dresses for day wear were made of silk and rayon. The length was now close to the ankles. They had a cinched in waist. Floral prints and polka dots were very popular. The suit of the 1930s is very simple, with a straight skirt and a jacket that marks the waist. There were three ranges of suit quality. The ready-made suit, which was made of soft materials and more affordable. Then there was the tailored suit, which was made of wool and cut by a tailor. The tailored suit was the choice of women who had more income. It was the uniform of the career woman. And the haute couture suit, which was made by famous couturiers and the preference amongst wealthy women. Furs were also very popular, at least among those who could afford it. In the 1920s, we see the rise of sunbathing, but by now this practice is part of everyone's life. This means that there is going to be fashion exclusively dedicated to beachgoers. Swimsuits are mostly made of knitwear, which could be of one or two piece suit. In America, Hollywood continues to influence the fashion market, introducing actresses from the studios in swimwear advertising. This is interesting as for the first time we see women's bodies being used to advertise products, though it already existed, in corsetry as an example. But this time it is a body that is wearing something that is going to be seen by everybody, meaning that the ideal body to wear this piece of clothing is the one advertised. Trousers were worn in the summer. They were wide leg trousers of nautical inspiration, Beach pajamas were very popular. Evening wear will be very different from day wear. Rich, middle-class or working girls would indulge in the glamour and fantasy of a beautiful, sensual dress. This is the glamorous look of the movie stars like Jane Harlow. Fabrics were often silk or synthetic silks and metallic shins. As sunbathing was so popular, backless dresses continued to be fashionable even more so than in the previous decade. We can see inspiration from the past in 1930s evening wear. Women dressed like in antiquity, where we can see the natural forms of the body. These dresses were so revealing that would dispense the corset that otherwise would be seen underneath. Someone who contributed to this look was Madeleine Vionnet with the bias cut. Though she did not invent it, she used this technique with great expertise. She would cut the fabric in a 45 degree angle to allow movement to the garment and accentuate the natural form of the woman's body. Vionnet avoided using buttons and fastens. The dresses could be slipped over the head. 
Madame Vianney started to employ this cut in the 1920s, and by the 1930s, fashion will embrace it as other designers will follow suit. In order to compose the 1930s look, it was mandatory to wear a hat. The cloche hat of the 1920s was very simple, and to be true, not much attention was given to the hats in this period. But the 1930s will give it great evidence. Hats become more elaborate, there will be more diversity of styles and a playfulness to it. The cloche hat was reinvented being closer to the head and framing the face. One of the most famous styles of the decade was the Garbo Slodge hat that was designed for her by Adrian in the movie Woman of Affair. This movie is from 1928 and this style will migrate into the 1930s. Elsa Schiaparelli was one of the best hat creators of the decade. In 1930 she launches the Madcap, which was a knit hat that could be stretched and adapted to the wearer's head. This hat was a great success. Barrett's came in many forms. Marlene Dietrich popularized the look of wearing a Barrett with a man's suit. As for shoes, silk and metallic T-bar shoes were the fashion of evening wear. The greatest innovation in shoes in the 1930s were sandals. The open shoe was not only worn at the beach but also on day-to-day -day life. In this decade of ultra-femininity, women will let their hair grow, the bob will be a longer one, curls will be very fashionable in elaborate hairstyles. Women continue to dye their hair with chemical hair dye. The great ambition of the 1930s was to be blonde. Much to the influence of movie stars, as this is a hair color that works very well in the screen, illuminating the face. The most famous blonde of the decade, and of all times, was Jean Harlow, also nicknamed the Blonde Bombshell or the Platinum Blonde. Harlow had natural blonde hair, but not as blonde as we know it. She would apply a mixture of peroxide, ammonia, Clorox and Lux flakes on a weekly basis. Her blonde shade was so popular that there were competitions to see if any hairdresser could match this color. Women started to follow this style to emulate the movie star. Harlow died at the age of 26 of kidney failure. Many attribute the cause of death to the constant use of the ingredients to dye her hair, because the combination of Clorox and ammonia can cause kidney failure. Nevertheless, she remains immortal due to her blonde locks. In the 1930s, it was essential to apply a full face of makeup to face the world. Now it is considered sloppy not to wear makeup. Women look to makeup as a way to enhance their sophistication. The introduction of color movies will impact the cosmetic industry. Bright blue and green eyeshadow and orange lips were considered chic. The 1930s makeup look consisted in high thin eyebrows, eyeshadows of light colors, false eyelashes, natural glossy red lips and cream rouge for the cheeks. The greatest style icons of the 1930s were definitely the movie stars. Greta Garbo had the face of the decade, a high arch eyebrow, a defined jawline. She would wear comfortable clothes and Oxford shoes. One of her stylish outfits consisted in tailored shirts, a tie and formal trousers. This was her personal style. But in the movies, she would wear extravagant and very feminine outfits designed by famous costume designers like Adrian. But one of the most iconic figures of the decade was Marlene Dietrich. She constructed her own image with costumes, makeup and lighting. Dietrich personified elegance and a certain mystery. She was one of the first women to wear man suits. In the famous movie Morocco in 1930, she appears in a tuxedo and kisses a woman on the lips. Marlena was admittedly bisexual. She used her clothes to manifest her personality. Hollywood studios presented an assortment of glamorous actresses. 
whose image became increasingly important. Beauty expectations for women in general started to rise, and they tried to reach the perfection only possible in the movies. The 1930s were a decade of trying to fit in and play by the rules, but in the end, the most iconic fashion memories reside in those who broke the rules and defied conventions. This was Fashion History Sessions on the fashion of the 1930s. If you like this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe.